Good evening, friends. It's a privilege to be here tonight. This is my second time to be here in this um, Grantway Assembly for my dear brother Mac and all this fine staff here and the joining Christians from different churches. Brother Lee Vale and I just met a brother here that a, a bosom friend to Brother F.F. F. Bosworth. I didn't even know Brother Bosworth had gone on to meet the Lord. I said, I feel like I met the Elisha that poured water on Elijah's hands when they had uh, been abroad and didn't know that Brother Bosworth had gone on to meet the Lord at 84 years old. Now I want to greet the folks who is on the telephone hookup tonight sure. across the country, all the way from California to New York and Texas and, and up the different parts of the nation from Maine to California. So we got a, a system of hooking up. Uh, these telephones that's been a great blessing and now we understand through our good friend brother Perry Green that they've got a, a little gadget they can put on your television set and not only will it be on the telephone but it'll be televised right in your television set also and they're seeing about it now and uh, sister Mac I'm glad to see you looking fine sitting here at the organ tonight and um, many of my friends I see from down at the Sir Vesta and Brother Borders, or Brother Roberson, rather, from Indiana, many. I want to say to the folks up at the Tabernacle tonight, look like half of them's down here, and uh, from the Tabernacle of Jeffersonville. And to my friend up there, Brother Kuntz, that uh, you called in about concerning that sick request. I'm praying for it, Brother Kuntz. Just have faith. Don't worry. It'll be all right. And down into Texas, Brother Blair. If you're listening in tonight, my brother, just remember this, that God who brought you through the first time can bring you through the second. And we're believing that God will grant this to you. And don't you take the devil's lie about anything. You just remember that God is God, and, there's, and he still remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we love him and believe him, and we're praying for you. To all of our friends in California, to Brother Mercer and up here in Arizona, Many other places, Phoenix and Brother Williams, and you all are hooked up up there tonight. All around, we're certainly grateful, and down in Georgia, and we're certainly thankful for every one of you. The Lord bless you. I have a feeling of real welcome here tonight in this uh, fine church, the Assembly of God here on Grant Way, and with Brother Mac, my good friend. God has blessed Brother Mac. I remember one time in Canada. That he was, I was riding back a trail on a horse way back into the jungles, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me to get off and pray for Brother Mac. At that time, he was in an emergency, and the Lord healed him. And so I'm so thankful for that Amen. and to be assembled here tonight with him to worship the Lord in this fine truth. A man sitting on a platform behind me said, I don't guess you know me. He said, one time you picked me up as a hitchhiker and I don't know, somewhere up in Boston or somewhere, Detroit, <laughs> hitchhiking. And I said, well... I usually try to have a hand out if I can for those who are needy. And so tonight we're all needy and we pray that yeah. God will give us a hand tonight yeah. of help, of blessings, and um, of His grace and mercy. Now, I'm kind of prone to speaking a long time, but I try not to do that tonight because the people up in Ohio just called Mrs. Dow and the group up there, Brother McKinney and Brother Brown and all them hooked in through Ohio. We send you greetings also. It's late up in New York, and I suppose it's about 11 or 12 o'clock at this time in New York, and the churches come and waited till this hour just for the service. We're grateful for those fine friends around everywhere. Now, before we open the word, let's just speak to the author a moment while we bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we are our hearts are overjoyed for the privilege that we have of being alive here tonight and assemble together with your people, the people in whom we believe to live forever. We now possess eternal life because you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In his pilgrimage here on the earth, he taught us, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into the judgment, but has passed from death unto life, because we believe on the only begotten Son of God. How we thank you for this great Savior, and we pray tonight that his great presence will so bless us together here as we read of his word 
and speak on it. Let the Holy Spirit take that to each heart throughout the nation, Lord, wherever people are gathered together. Bless other ministers who are in the pulpit. We pray, Father, that you will bless this Grantway Assembly, its pastor, his wife, his children, the deacons, trustees, and all the board. And Father, together may we work for the kingdom of God while it's enough light to see where we're getting around. For the hour's coming when no man can work. And Father, while we have this privilege, may we, may we redeem the time. Lord, may we, that be granted to us. Heal the sick and the afflicted throughout the land. Lord. May the presence of God be felt in every crack and corner of the nation tonight. We realize that judgment is striking. Great faults are falling in, and the nation is shaking in earthquakes in diverse places. Great historical things that we've uh, heard of in the days past of judgment uh, through the Bible, and we see it repeating again today, a prophecy saying, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And we see it happening now. Man's heart's failing, perplexity of time, distress between nations. God, we know we're at the end time. Help us, Lord, to, to take the message to every crack and corner, to every child that you've ordained to life. Grant it, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, bless the reading now of his word. Now, many of you like to kind of look into the Bible where a minister is reading, and I want to read tonight a couple, three verses out of the Psalms, Psalms 42, just for a, the way of having a text. And I've got some scriptures written out here, and I want to refer to them, if I can, as we go along in the next few minutes to speak on this subject. The Psalm of David. David wrote the Psalms. Now, while you're turning, I might say this. Many people say, well, is the Psalms inspired? Certainly they are. They are anything it's, it's uh, this Bible is inspired. Whether it's history, whether it's songs, whatever it is, it's inspired. Jesus said, have not you read what David said in the Psalms? And then I think Psalms, of course, is songs. And if songs are inspired of God, which I believe they are, and prophetic also, I hope I'm standing that day when this song comes to pass, there's going to be a meeting in the air in that sweet, sweet by and by, going to meet you and greet you over there in that home beyond the sky. Such singing ever heard, ever heard by mortal ears, it'll be glorious, I do declare. And God's own Son will be the leading one at that meeting in the air. Yeah. Oh, I, I want to be there at that time. Now, Psalms uh, 42. As the heart painteth after the water brooks, so painteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night while, my, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? I think David in the writing of this psalm must have been in distress. And it usually takes distress to bring the best out of a man. It really, uh, that's when God... Uh, gets down to when we fast many times to get herself in position, to get herself out of the way. And I think when David got in these places, then he began to meditate on the Lord, begin to think about the things. Many times God gets us in, in tight corners where we have to look up. Sometimes we even have to get on our back in the hospital or a bed somewhere so we can look up to see where the great blessings of God comes from. Now, the word I want to speak from tonight, one word out of the Bible, and that is found in the second verse, uh, thirst. The word uh, thirst. I was looking in the dictionary when I was uh, looking up this uh, word. I was thinking about a, a sermon one time I preached on uh, thirsting after life and uh, took it out of the Psalms too when David said, thy statues, I believe, are more precious to me than life. And I was looking and thinking about that word thirst, so I looked up in the dictionary to see what it means. And here's what Webster says. It's a painful desire. 
a painful, when you want something so bad until it becomes painful to you. Uh, now, uh, that's, uh, it's not an unnatural thing to thirst. Thirst is a, a natural thing. It's just simply something that God has given us that we could uh, to give us a, a desire for something. Sometimes God has uh, also has given you a, a control tower, something that sets inside of you that, that controls these different desires. And this uh, thirst, this control tower that sets in a man's heart, is something that God gave him to, to warn him of the desires that's needful for him. Now, there is two different kinds of thirst. There is a thirst physically, and there is a thirst also spiritually. I would like to read this, what David said again, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, not some historical or some something that happened some years ago or or some tale that someone told, but for the living God, a God that's ever-present. And his soul thirsted for that God, not for some historical something. Now we find God uh, gives the control tower to you to give to you the things that you need. Now the control tower in you is what directs you. And this thirst runs in on this cold uh, control tower and tells you what you have need of. Spiritually speaking, the control tower in the body and in the soul also, there's a control tower in the body that tells you the need that's needed in your body. And it's brought to you by thirst. Also, there's a control tower in your soul that tells you the spiritual things that you have need of, something in your spirit. And, and you, by this, can tell what kind of a life is controlling you. When you, uh, when you can see what your desires are, then you can tell by that what kind of something is in you that's creating this desire that you have. See, there's a certain thing that you thirst for, and it, and it can tell you in your soul what this desire is by the nature of the thirst that you have. I hope that you can understand that. There is a, a control tower of the soul and one for the body. And each tower is a warning caller for the needs of the other. Each one calls to the need for what the caller is calling for. It sends out a wave of warning. For instance, the, the flesh thirsts to satisfy the desires that's in the body. And the spirit uh, desires for the things that's in the soul desire is. And many times these war one against the other. We find there what's the, a great trouble today that too many people uh, try to live between those two desires. For one of them desires the things of the earth. The other desires the things of heaven. Like Paul said, describes it in Romans 7, 21. When I would do good, then evil is nigh. When you try, did you ever have that in experienced Christians? That when you're trying to do something that's worthwhile, go to make an effort to do something that's good, then you find out that there is the devil on every hand just to upset you. Everything that you... And that's one good thing that I'd like to uh, say this. And the Christians might know that when you're, when you're starting to do something and there's something always trying to upset you and doing it, do it anyhow. That's the devil there trying to keep you from doing what's right. Now, many times I meet people that's prone to be a little nervous when they find out that they're trying to do something and, and everything's just blocking it off on both sides to say, it might not have been the will of the Lord, see uh, don't let the devil lie to you like that. The first thing is find out whether it's the will of God or not. And then, if you want to know where it's the will of God, look into the Bible. There is a thing that uh, sets you straight, is the Word of God. And then, if you see it's in the Word of God for you to do it, like, for instance, seeking for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, 
Many times I've run into people who say, well, I sought for the Holy Ghost, and I just couldn't receive it. I don't believe it's for me. Every time I get down, I get sick, and I go to praying. If I fast, I get sick. And if I try to uh, stay all night, I, say, I get so sleepy, I, I can't get off my feet. Remember, that is the devil. Because God intends for you to have the Holy Spirit as far whosoever will. Many times you find when you're prayed for in a meeting for divine healing, then the next day you find out, no doubt, that the devil will make that twice as bad as it was the day before. See? Remember, that's just Satan trying to get you away from the blessing that God's got for you. See? Don't you listen to that fellow. See, always press right on. I had an experience of that just recently on the road to Africa. If I ever had any time that the devil ever did press at me was to go to Africa this last time and become one of the, the finest meetings and times that I ever went overseas. I got, I believe, more things accomplished in that little time that I was there besides my hunting trip than I ever did at any time. I always thought that those churches didn't want me there and Come to find out, I had a letter from someone that it was, uh, oh, they didn't want me there, all the association, and found out it was one man with a letter head from an organization that said, we don't want you, he meant him and his family. See? So then when I got over there, I see just we, that was he and his family, and it wasn't the people at all. So now it's a great field opened up for us. You see, when Paul said, when I would do good, then evil is not. You let a young convert come tonight to the altar somewhere here in this tabernacle or, or out across the nation, and just remember tomorrow, mother will be more angry than she ever was, dad will be all upset, and all the school kids and everything just goes wrong because it's Satan trying to get you to turn around. He's trying to run you off the path. When I would do good, then evil is always not. Now, let us... Look at the thirst, and let's see whether uh, actually a thirst is a natural thing. I've had people tell me, oh, I never did. I believe it's just for some people to want to be Christians. Oh, no, that's wrong. It's actually a something that's associated with every human being. It certainly is true. When we come to this country in the early days, we found the Indians here. And the Indians, though they were heathen at that time, they worshipped the sun or something, as long as they are human, there's something in them, a natural thirst, calling out for God somewhere. Amen. Back in the jungles just recently, back there uh, 480 miles from the closest civilization, a little small town of about 3,000 people of Byra and Mozambique, we found natives that didn't even, never seen a white person. Uh, found a native girl. She had no clothes on any of them, Harley have clothes on and she was sitting up in a tree and I was tracking a line and there was I heard something like a human being screaming this native girl sitting up there wall eyed holding a baby and what she was scared about that her only protection is get up a tree from a lion leopard or something or some animal and she'd see me and heard it was a human being but when she looked and seen a white person she had never seen one in her life see and she was scared to death See, but when we find those people, even in that primitive condition, back there, they were still worshiping. Before we called a lion in, they poured out some mealy meal, that's what they eat, on a little leaf and clapped their hands and called on the spirit of some great something they didn't know where, like a patron saint or something to a Catholic, to protect them that they wouldn't be uh, killed during the time of the charge of this lion. See, it's something natural. It's not an unnatural thing to thirst for God. It's a natural thing. It's just something that you should do. God has made you up like that. And it's no superhuman. It's just actually a common human being. It ain't just special for some people. They say, well, I've seen some people live such a, a victorious life that they're constantly on the housetop. They're praising God. Wish I could feel that way. Well... The reason you're feeling that way, it's a thirst in you. Amen. And uh, that's just a natural thing. It's for every person to thirst for God. Now, we'll take some of the natural thirsties first. Let's take, for instance, thirsting for water, as David said here, uh, thirsting for oh, the water. Thirsting for water, 
the body is in need of water. And if you don't supply that thirst, you'll perish. You'll dehydrate. And you'll, the, you won't live. If you can't get water to that thirst, to quench that thirst of the natural body, you'll soon perish. You won't live long. You can live longer without food than you can without water. Because you can fast for 40 days, Jesus did, I suppose, without, without food. But you couldn't do that long without water. You would just simply dry up and die. You must have uh, water. And, if, and the thirst that comes on you, why, it's to show that the body is in need of something to keep it alive. The body's got to have the water in order to stay alive. You're 80-something percent uh, water and petroleum anyhow, and you've got to take these sources in to keep you alive. As I've said, if you neglect it, you'll perish. Uh, the thirst also is an alarm. It's an alarm clock. That thirsting, the soul sets off alarm clock, a little buzzer inside of you that tells you that death has lurking nigh. That if you don't get water pretty soon, you've got to die. And it gets louder and louder until finally you keep putting it off and you'll die because it's alarm clock. Like David described it here in the Psalms, as the heart painteth after the water brooks, so painteth my soul after thee, O God, as the heart painteth after the water brook. I've often thought as reading of this, of David, David was a woodsman, a hunter, and he hunted deer, of course, and many... Uh, we in this day hunt them. The heart is a deer. And we find, if you ever seen the dogs, the wild dogs will grab a deer. And uh, usually they got like the coyote of fang. And he can grab the deer right above the burr of the ear here and swing his weight. He cuts the throat of the deer. And the deer doesn't have a chance then. But sometimes the, the, the dog, like in Africa there, the wild dog, will grab the deer right in the flanks. If he misses the throat, he'll grab the second time at the flank. And if the deer is strong enough and quick enough, he can shake the dog off. The deer is much faster. The dog stalks him uh, when he's not looking and when he's upwind from him. And, and he, uh, he don't know the, the dog is near. And then when the wild dog grabs him, if he's real quick, he can throw it off. And, well, but when the dog comes out of the flank, he's got a whole mouthful of the deer's flesh. Or when he grabs at his neck sometimes, he'll cut close to the jugular vein and miss it. And the deer's shaking him, will pull a whole chunk of meat out of the deer's throat. Then the blood begins to run. And then the dog will come right on the trail of that blood after the deer. And as the life of the deer begins to dwindle, as the blood, is, which is the life stream to the body, as that begins to dwindle down, the deer gets weaker and the dog, then, or the wolf is right behind the deer. Now, if that deer can't find water, now water has something in it that when the deer drinks the water, it stops the bleeding. But if he don't get water to cool him off, then the, the blood keeps flowing out faster because he's running, keeping his heart pumping. But if he can ever get to water, the deer will live. Now, there's a great lesson there. See? And David's saying here, As the heart painteth for the water brook, my soul painteth for thee, O God. Now, that deer knows that unless he finds water, he's gone. He just can't live. I've tracked him many times after being wounded. When he hits a stream of water, he'll cross in and get a drink, go up over the hill, come back down, cross get a drink of water and go up, you'll never catch up with him as long as he'll follow that stream. But once when he leaves the stream, if he can't find another water brook somewhere, you'll catch him right away. And now the deer knows that, so he'll stay right with the water where he can get to it right quick. Now could you imagine a deer with his nose up 
He's been caught out somewhere where there's no water. And he says, as the heart uh, thirst or paineth is the thirst after the water brooks, my soul thirst after thee, O God. Unless I can find you, Lord, I'll perish. I, I, I can't go unless I find you. And when a man or woman, boy or girl, gets that kind of a thirst for God, he's going to find something. See? But when we come at it just kind of halfway, well, I'll kneel down and see what the Lord does. See, you're not really thirsting yet. It's got to be a thirst between death and life. And then something takes place. The deer also here, he's, uh, we find uh, and he is, also has another sense of smell that sets off an alarm in him when his enemy is near. He's possessed this uh, little creature with a, a sense to protect himself. And he's, uh, he's got a little alarm in him, a little something that he, he tickles his nose when the enemy's near. You can get in the wind of the enemy and he knows that you're there and he's gone. Sometimes a half a mile away, he can smell you and get away or the wolf or any danger. He's able to sense it because that he's made up that way. He's a deer by nature. And that sense in him is just one of the God giving senses to him to live by. And I thought comparing the deer with a man that's thirsting for God. Before the enemy gets there, there's something about a child of God that when you once are born into the Spirit of God, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's something about the person that can sense the enemy. You can take a man when he's taking the Scripture and reading the Scripture and trying to inject something to that Scripture that's contrary to the Scripture. A man that's filled with the Holy Ghost can sense that right quick. There's something out of the way. When he gets into a place and, and uh, that little certain sense in there that uh, it's done to protect your life, you, you, mustn't, uh, you mustn't never go for anything unless it's exactly the Word of God. You must stay right exactly with that Word. And now, and we're uh, uh, secured with that sense as long as we're in the Holy Spirit. You can go to read, and, like for instance, somebody say, now go to read Mark 16 and say, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues, or take up serpents, or drink daily things. It will not harm them. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Now, then you find a person get up there and say, Now, that was for the apostolic age. That, now, right quick, if you have received the Holy Spirit, you've been endowed with that sense. Amen. It sets it off. There's something wrong there. That's right. That's right. See? You try to explain it away that's for another day. That uh, really, you don't need those things today. But Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. There's a little, something sets off in you, a little buzzer, and knowing that that's wrong. And that's the way of death. Because Jesus said, if we add one word to this or take one word from it, our part's taken out of the book of life. See? Not one scripture. We must take it just the way it's written. And God watches over his word to perform it. And we know that it's got to be just right. So therefore, no matter what a church would say, what anyone else would say, if you're born of the Spirit of God, you become part of the Bible. God told Ezekiel, he the prophet, he said, take the scroll and eat it. Then the prophet and the scroll became part of each other. And that's the believer when he receives the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, and the Spirit of God is the Word of God. My words are spirit. In the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hebrews 13, 80 is the same, yesterday, today, and forever. And when you are a part of that Word, Amen. oh, then let something come up contrary to that Word, because the little buzzer sets off right quick. See, it's to warn you that death is in the road. We should never do that. There is a, also these thirsts are just natural. 
They are natural for the Christian. They are natural for the human being. There is also a thirst for success. So many people today, how we school for this thirst? We just notice the start of the university up. And we go down there and people spend thousands of dollars to send their children to the school and, and to universities and colleges and so forth to get an education to be successful, they call it, in life. But now I have nothing against that. Now, that's all right. But to me, you could get all the schooling in the world and still you haven't found the right success. That's right. Because that will just temporarily make uh, things a little easier for you here. And there's, uh, but when you die, you leave all that behind you. And this entire economy that we have, I was saying the other day at Phoenix, I stand quoting again, that all this modern civilization, the whole educational program, the whole scientific program is all contrary to God's Word and His will. Civilization is absolutely, there will never be a civilization in the world that is to come like this one. This is the perverted civilization. God had His first civilization upon the earth when He spoke His words and they come up every seed of its kind. And in that civilization, there was no death, sickness, sorrow. And now we take the things that is in the scientific world that was put here to hold it together and pervert it into something, and that brings death. Like the atomic bomb. I don't know the formulas of these things, but I might say this wrong. You take uranium to split a, a molecule, and a molecule breaks an atom. Or, what does it do that? It just annihilates almost, just destroys. Everything that we do, we take medicine, put this formula with this formula to cure this and put it into us, and what do we do? We tear down something else. Now, I guess you read, read last month's Reader's Digest. That is said that in this age that we're living in now, that young men and women meet, reach middle age between 20 and 25 years old. Think of that. Little girls in menopause and 20, 22, 23 years old. Middle age. You see, what's done it? It's been this hybrid food and stuff we're eating. See, it's the stuff, the food and the, the life that we're living. Scientists has brought it to us, and in doing so, they're killing you. I was in Africa where I see them boys that never had a dose of medicine in their life. They eat uh, meat that had maggots in it. They drink out of a pool that it looked like would kill an ox. And I was shooting a target at 200 yards, and I couldn't see it with a pair of 750 binoculars. And a man my age is standing there telling me where I was hit with his naked eye. <laughs> Now, if all this modern culture has done something, I feel if I had his eyes and his stomach, I'd be a pretty good man. Yeah. But there you are. You see, that's what science, education, civilization, we're destroyed by it. We destroy ourselves. It started in the Garden of Eden and runs on far today. But thirsting for success. Man, we thirst for fellowship. We go, we want fellowship. It's like a young man and a young woman. Now, it's not unnecessary or not, uh, I mean, unnatural for a young man and a young woman to, to love one another. It is a thirst for love. It's her age. And they, they love one another, and it's not unnatural. That's just a natural thing for them to do that. Now, we find many things in the life that we live in the natural body that we thirst for. It's just something sets in us. We want to do it. We absolutely feel that it's necessary, and it is necessary that we do it. We find many uh, women um, in these days uh, uh, thirst for beauty. Now, there isn't a woman. It's a natural thing for a woman to thirst to be pretty. That's, that's her God-given instinct and in, in her beauty that God gave her for her mate. And now we find out that women want to be that way. Why is it? It's just because it's something God gave her. It's not wrong for women to be pretty. They should be. And you know, they are the only creature that, that the female is prettier than the male. It's in the human race. Every other animal. 
take the, the cow to the bull, the doe deer to the buck, the hen to the rooster, the mother bird to the father bird. Always you find the male is big and pretty. But on the human race, show, there's where the perversion comes. It turns around. And it's the women. So it's, it's pretty. And they lust to be pretty. Not like some of these worried creatures we see on the street of this day. <laughs> no, no. Not that kind of pretty. No. That's the hardest looking sight I've ever seen in my life. Yes, sir. That is the perversion. That's perverting the true thirst. Now, the true thirst that a woman should have would be to adorn themselves in modest apparel and to have a Christ-like spirit, 1 Timothy 2.9. Now, that's a way the woman should thirst to be. Now, if you want to be pretty, that's the way what makes you pretty. See? It's a Christ-like spirit adorned in modest apparel. Oh, my, some of these people today, uh, out on the streets, you can't tell a man from the woman. And it, it's a... It's the most horrible looking thing. It should, I, it's, it's, I, I never see anything like, like human beings. It's beyond human. Eyes painted way up like that. And, you know, and funny looking lizard uh, 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 eyes and all them uh, funny looking clothes. And, well, I don't even also out of form, they don't even look like a human being. And some of them boys out here with their hair combed down, their sister's rollers in front here, you know. Why, it's a complete perversion. Right. It's a, it's a, it's Satan, and Satan is a perverter. When God made everything in the Garden of Eden, it was lovely. Then Satan come in and perverted. Satan cannot create nothing. There's only one creator. That's God. But Satan perverts the original creation. And now he's got into this. I want to speak tonight about perverting the the original creation of thirst. Now, a woman, as I said before, wants to be pretty. There's something in her that she's feminish, and she wants to be that way. But the way they are on the street today, hair cut like a man, wearing man's clothes, and then man turn around wearing women's clothes and a hair cut like a woman. See, it's a perversion, the whole thing. Your food's perverted. Your life's perverted. Your thirst's perverted. Your desire's perverted. It's a day of perversion. I was speaking here not long ago on Satan's Eden. God took 6,000 years and made a perfect Eden. Satan come over and sprayed them seeds and deformed them. Now he's got 6,000 years and he's got his own scientific Eden. Right back again on a perversion of the right. And this is the age of high breeding. High breeding. They've even got the, the churches today to their high bread. That's right. They get in here, they just go to church. It's a lodge instead of a church. A church is a place where people come together and worship God in spirit and in truth. And today it's a lodge. We go there and have a little time to shake hands and fellowship and some black coffee in the back of the building and go home till next week. We've done our religious duty. Now, it's a perverted age. And Satan is perverting these thirst that God put in you to thirst. Satan is perverting them. Now, if you want to know the right perversion, if you, uh, the women wants to be pretty, take 1 Timothy 2.9. That's how they're adorning themselves in modest spirit, with apparel, with a Christ-like spirit, meek, subject to their husbands and so forth. That's the way that you should be adorned. Your life you live. He perverts the true nature of God and the true thirst of God of the body and soul by lust for sin. Sin, a perversion. Now, we find out a person today, the way they've took that perversion, thirst for God, the thirst for to be pretty, and all these thirst for, for water, they turn that into satisfying that with drinking. The thirst for joy, everybody wants to have joy. Thirst for fellowship, all these great thirsts that God put into us, that we might thirst after Him, God made you to thirst after Him. And we try to satisfy it with some other kind of a thirst, with some other kind of a perversion of the correct thirst. See how it's in the natural? See how it's in the spiritual? We think as long as we join church, that's, that's, satis that's all we have to do. Well, that is absolutely wrong. No, God wants you to thirst for Him. Amen. As the heart painted for the water brook, 
My soul thirsts after thee, O God. See? See? Now, uh, if that deer was panting for the water brook, what if somebody come along and another buddy deer could come along and say, say, i tell you what I, I, I can do. I know where's a mud hole down here. Well, he, he, that deer wouldn't want that. He, that wouldn't do him any good. And there's nothing can satisfy that thirst that's in a human being until God comes in. He must have it or die. And no person has a right to try to hush or satisfy that holy thirst within him by the things of the world. Amen. No, sir. It's ungodly to do so. And if you thirst for God, don't shake hands with the preacher and put your name on the book. If you're thirsting for God, there's only one thing to satisfy, that's meet God. Amen. If you're thirsting for God, that's the only way you can meet Him is to do that. And then there is a great danger also if you don't watch what you're doing in that time. If you're thirsting for God, be sure it's God you find. Yeah. See? Be sure that it's, your thirst is satisfied. But if Satan has been able to pervert you from these natural appetites, and that he'll do if he can. He'll, he'll simply make you try to be satisfied. A man get out. What makes a man get drunk? Is because he's wearied and tore up. There's something lacking in him. I was at Mayo here not long ago, and I was up there on an interview, and then was told in this that talking about drinking, and uh, I told him that my father drank. So what made him drink? I said I don't know. He said it's because that there was something that he wasn't satisfying him, and he thought he could drink to throw it off his mind. I caught it right then. See. It was really God was the only thing can satisfy that thirst. God Himself is the only thing can satisfy that human thirst is to accept God. Now, Satan takes these things, as I said, and perverts them. Then, if, you're, if, you're, if you won't give that thirst the right place in your life and won't thirst and take the things that God provided to stop that thirst with, to quench it, then Satan will lead you to some of his stagnant cesspools of this world. You must have it somewhere. If you can't find food, you'd eat from a garbage can. See? And if you, if you couldn't find water and you was dying, you'd drink out of a, a pool of any kind because you're perishing. But there's no reason for that, for when you're thirsting for God, because God is a living God. Not some historical something. My soul thirsts for thee, the living God. Amen. Something that gives living waters. Something that satisfies. There's another nature, a natural, just a natural thirst, uh, and that thirst of the soul. You might say, Brother Branham, is that soul thirst, is that natural? Yes, that's natural for a soul to thirst. And um, it's for God made you this way. That's so that you would thirst for Him. He wants you to thirst after Him. Now, God made you like that. He didn't have to make you like that, but He did do it. And if He hadn't made you like that so that you would thirst, there would be an excuse at the judgment bar say, I, I, I never did thirst for God. But there's no excuse you do. You'll make it somewhat. You might make it your wife. You might make it your car. You might make it something else. You might go to church and try to satisfy it. And I, nothing gets going to church, but that isn't a satisfaction. It's to find God, the living God, the God of heaven into your soul that satisfies that longing and thirsting that you belong for. Now, for he made you so you could thirst for him, for his fellowship. Now, there's a genuine thirst for fellowship. Now, we like to meet with one another. We're doing that tonight. We meet here together tonight because we like to fellowship one with the other. Why do we do that? Because there's something in us that we want to meet one another. That's just natural. And now we meet on a common ground here. That is because we're all thirsting for God. Amen. See? And then we meet here on this regular common ground here of fellowship in the church tonight. Here might be many different denominational views and so forth. But when it comes to that thirst, we can meet on a common ground. One ground we all thirst. Some might be even sprinkling the other in baptism and one in pouring or so forth. But when it comes to the thirst for God, we, we come on one mutual ground. And God made us so that we would do that. 
thirst for him and for his fellowship. I don't know anything. When I was a little boy, I remember I was raised in a real poor family. And I remember of many times I'd go out with fellows. Uh, they couldn't dress like to go out to a decent place. But I, I don't know. There's something about uh, people that I liked. I, I liked to get with them, but I was more or less what's called a black sheep. And when I got saved and found that something in me that I thirsted for, a, a friend, somebody that would be a buddy to me, somebody I could trust, somebody you could sit down to and talk your troubles over with. And when I found that real, true satisfaction, when I found Jesus Christ, Amen. that real, true satisfier that Amen. takes away all, all uh, quenches all that thirst and gives you something that it just looks like that there's just nothing to take its place. And now, how Satan tries to pervert this satisfying of the soul, that thirst for the soul. He tries to give you everything to satisfy. And he's so deceitful in these days of perversion. This is a perverted world. It's a perverted race. It's a perverted people. Everything is perverted. And it's perverted so gradual until it's become the most deceitful age that we've, any human being ever lived in. It's more deceitful than it ever was. Now, you just, you just can't imagine of how uh, deceitful the nation's got, even with our own brethren, uh, like American people. I was speaking some time ago I was in the woods a few weeks ago and found a, uh, a cigarette pack laying in the woods. And it said on there, a thinking man's filter. And I went on down through the woods a little ways and I come back kept bearing on my mind, a thinking man's filter uh, and a smoking man's taste. Well, I was at the World Fair a couple of years ago, and they had that Yule Brenner and all of them over there, and was making de demonstrations of cigarettes, and how they took that smoke and put it across a piece of marble and took a Q-tip and raked up that nicotine off there and put it on the back of a rat. In seven days, he had so much cancer, he couldn't get up on his feet see, from one cigarette. And then they showed how and when that goes into the human lung, some of them say, I don't inhale, I just puff it in my mouth. Shows how it gets into the saliva and goes right down just the same into the throat. See? And then this man said, you see so much talk about a filter. He said, now, if you have a desire, there's a thirst, you see, a desire to smoke a cigarette, one natural cigarette might satisfy that desire for the time being. But if you've got a filter, it takes four cigarettes to satisfy it said, because you're only getting about one-fourth of the smoke. And said, a smoking man's taste, see, you cannot have smoke unless you get tar. And when you got tar, you got cancer. So there you are. See, it, it's just a gimmick. And I think of, of, of a, a tobacco company that's in this nation and, uh, and it lives by this nation. And then with a gimmick like that to absolutely deceive American citizens. To deceive them. A thinking man's filter, it's only a gimmick to sell more cigarettes. Then I thought of that thing, a thinking man's filter. I thought, that's a good idea. So there is a thinking man's filter. That's this Bible. A, a thinking man's filter, it'll take this filter, it'll produce a righteous man's taste. See? Now, you cannot pull sin through the pages of this Bible. No, it stops it. It fills it out. Now, you can go to church and just take anything. But you can't come through this Bible and have sin. It will not do it. It filters out all sin. And it gives a holy man's taste. Because if the man is thinking that he wants to be holy and be like God and be a son or a daughter of God, then he wants the right kind of a filter. So he stops all sin on this side of the Bible and he can only bring the Holy Spirit to the Bible that wrote the Bible. It's a holy man's taste to have this thinking man's filter. Now, we find how deceiving it is today. Matthew 24, 24, Jesus said in the last days that the two spirits would be so close to like until they would deceive the very elected if it was possible. How close, how, what a deception 
of, of right and wrong uh, we have today, even in our, in our government, in our politics, we, we haven't even got a man that we can put up as a politician that will absolutely stand up for what he thinks is right. Where is our Patrick Henry's and George Washington's and Abraham Lincoln's of today? Just as our president said there, the way that they want communism, they can have it, whatever the people wants. If that is uh, a man that won't speak his conviction, a man who will stand on a principle, that will stand on what, uh, what a principle, just want to go the, the, the way of least resistance. And that's the way that the people's got in the church. They want to come join church, and they say, oh, well, that, that's it. I, I'll join church now. You're trying to satisfy that great holy thirst that God put in you, that control tower trying to turn you to the right thing, and you try to satisfy it with joining a church, quoting a creed, or something like that, when it's nothing but the very presence and filling of the God himself in your life that will satisfy that. He won't be satisfied with the creed. You'll never pull a creed through that Bible. No, there's not even the Apostles' Creed so-called will never come through there. Show me the Bible where the Apostles' Creed says, I believe in the Holy Roman Catholic Church. I believe in the communion of saints. When the Bible said there's one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. You'll never pull that through the Bible. You'll never pull all these dances and shorts and things that the people are doing today, these twists and wasusies and all these things through God's Word. You'll never pull this modern trend of civilization through that Bible. It's against it. See? And you try to satisfy that thirst. But you see, it'll, this Bible will only satisfy a righteous man or woman's taste. This Holy Spirit that they would laugh at and said, you've gone out of your mind. But that satisfies. That long. That's something that the world knows nothing about. They have perverted themselves from true baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Word of God unto what? Unto the cesspools. The cesspools of the church. Of dogmas and creeds and, and denominational differences and so forth. Say, you're a Christian, I'm Methodist, I'm Baptist, I'm Presbyterian. That don't mean one thing to God. Not one thing. You can't pull in things through God's Bible here. And you're trying to satisfy that holy thirst that God give you to thirst after Him. Is that right? Amen. Now, you know that David said, You're for the living God. Now, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. Then there can be no satisfaction until this Word, which is God, becomes alive in you. Amen. Then you see... God Himself fulfilling the promises that He made in the Bible. Now, we have different interpreters of the Bible. One church interprets it this way, another one interprets it that way, and another one this way. Some don't take but a little bit of it, some take here and there a piece of it. But God's His own interpreter. When He makes a promise and fulfills it, that's the interpretation thereof. If I promised you I'd be here tonight, and here I am. That's the fulfilling of my promise. If I say, I meet you in the morning, and I'm there, that's my promise. They don't need to make any other excuses. I've got to be there. And when God makes a promise, and it comes around and fulfills that promise, that's the interpretation of the promise. I dare anybody to take God at His word and see if every word in that Bible isn't the truth. That's right. That's what that thirst is in there. You say, if I would have lived in the days of Jesus, I would have done so and so. Well, you're living in His days. What are we doing about it? What are we doing? You say, well, what you done? Perhaps what the Pharisees done. They belonged to church and denied Jesus Christ. We always say today, people try to say we compare, we got to compare Bible leaf with Bible leaf, Scripture with Scripture. That isn't the truth. No, it isn't the truth. This Greek word means this and this means that. The Greeks themselves, the, way back in the Nicaea Council, and them writers back in there, they had different forms. One believed this way, this Greek scholar meant this, and the other said this and meant it this way. And they fussed over it. We don't need interpretation of Greek scholars or Greek words.
to know him is life. The person, Christ himself. Not comparing. It's a revelation that God built his church upon. And if we don't build upon that same church, the Bible said, Abel, by faith. And faith is a divine revelation. See? Faith is a divine revelation. All right? This whole thing's built upon the revelation then. And unless this is revealed to you, Jesus said, I thank thee, Father, that thou hast hid these things from the wise of this world and revealed it to babes such as will learn. See? Now, the whole thing is built there. You've got to know the person. And you cannot satisfy that by joining church. You've got to find the person, God himself, which is the word in, in interpretation of himself today. The promises that he made today. The people that he was going to have in this day. The church without spot or wrinkle. Don't mean a denomination. It means the persons, the individuals. Without spot or wrinkle. Be two in the bed, I'll take one, leave one. Two in the field, I'll take one, leave one. But when God, that holy thirst to be like him, and then you see that his word is in you, vindicating itself, that you are God's servant. Whatever God says, you're just told right up to it. Then you're coming through the right process then to satisfy that holy thirst that's in you. Oh, of course, the people will laugh at you and say, you've lost your mind, you've gone crazy, but... They remember what they're drinking from. See? Look where they're at. Could you imagine a big artesian well spurting up fine water and somebody down at one of them holes down there with dead tadpoles and creeds and everything on it, drinking down there, looking up and making fun of you? <laughs> Why, he doesn't know. He doesn't know what, the, what a thirst-quenching stream you're living at. It's exactly right. We got a living God. Not one died... 1,900 years ago and stayed in the grave, but one that raised again. Amen. Hebrews 13, 8 says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost is the same Holy Ghost that's here now. Amen. He's the satisfying potion because he is the Word. That's right. The Holy Ghost wrote the Word. He interprets the Word. The Bible said in Second Peter that the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. Man of old, moved by the Holy Ghost, wrote the Bible. Now, you can't do it. You can't satisfy that holy thirst with nothing less than God Himself living in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. Education, culture, joining churches, reciting creeds, going to belong to fellowships, all these things are very good, but they absolutely will not stop that holy hush. That holy thirst, rather, won't hush that holy thirst I was listening to Billy Graham, the great evangelist, the other night. I'll tell you, I'm praying more for him now than I ever did. And I see him really wrapping it to him the way they did. He said that bunch of clergymen coming down the road, them collars turned around, going down there where they had no business to go, sticking their nose in something, but they was going down the road, clapping their hands and patting their foot. Well, they look like unholy rovers. Now, you see, but they got something they, they believe in. They got something it excites the soul. They got something they was excited about. Some woman went and stuck her head in something down there and they thought she was a martyr. And she had no business to be into. Now we find that these men had something they could clap their hands about. They were happy they were doing something. Well, if you can do that for a, a principle that you think is right here, and then stand in the church and somebody clap their hands or pat their foot, the deacons and lead them out the door. See, they have turned their people to a filthy cesspool of creed and denomination instead of feeding them on the blessed holy word of God that's delivered by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. See, they try to, they quench the thirst by saying, I'm Dr. So-and-so or come out of a certain seminary or a certain school. That don't mean one thing. Not a thing. But you see, they, they try to satisfy themselves, say, now God will recognize me because I am his pastor. God will recognize me because I'm Holy Father so-and-so or Bishop so-and-so or, or something like that. They're trying to satisfy their thirst there when you can't do it. I got a Ph.D., LLD, I got my Bachelor of Art, I got this. That's all right. But to me, that just means you're that much farther away from God. That's right. That much farther away from God all the time. You only know God by an experience. You cannot educate this into you. It's born into you. It's something that God gives you. Education has nothing to do with it. 
One of the greatest men of the Bible couldn't even sign his name, St. Peter. That's exactly right. And him and John, the Bible said they were both ignorant and unlearned. But it pleased Jesus to give you the keys to the kingdom. Because he was thirsting for God. Amen. Thirsting for God. Fellowship. Yes, sir. Oh, my. I think of Isaiah, that young man. Oh, a fine young man. He was down there in the temple one day. The great uh, king had... He put his face towards him and thought he was one of the greatest men, which he was a great man. He's raised up fine parents, a good mother and dad. But when he went out, his politics was clean and he, he made things right with God. And Isaiah looked at him and thought he was a great man. Put him for an example. But don't you never put no man but the man Christ Jesus for your example. All man will fail. After a while, he got to a place. He was his king, but he tried to take a priest's place and went into the temple and he was stricken with leprosy. Then Isaiah was all weary. So he goes down to the temple and he began to, to pray. He thought he'd go down and pray a while. And now look, that man was a prophet. But down there in the temple, as a young man, he was crying out to God one day and a vision fell before him. And when he did, he seen uh, angels, cherubims with their faces covered with their, with their wings and their feet covered and flying with two wings. And they were going back and forth up and down through the temple crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah, that great thirst that he had had, he, had, he had perhaps a school, he, he probably had a good education. He had a, a marvelous conception of what God ought to be. He, he had heard the priest. He had been to the temple. He had been raised to be a, a believer. But you see, he had never come face to face with it before. See? He, he had a desire to do right. He wanted to be right, but he just had the educational side. He had the theological side of it. But when he got there in the temple that day and he seen these cherubims waving these wings back and forth and realized that these angels ministered in the face of God. And them angels didn't even know what sin was. And to stand in the presence of God, they had to cover their holy faces. To stand in the presence of God. Then that prophet cried out, Woe is me! For I'm a man of unclean lips. All of my theology theology and stuff that I've learned, all of my marvelous conception that I had of God, I'm face to face with it now. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell of people that's unclean lips. All their teaching of the laws and things they had done had never reached that place to where he come into the presence of God and seen God with his own eyes. And his trail when he's sitting up on high in the heavens. And there he was face to face with reality. And he cried, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among unclean people. And then it was that the cherubim took the thongs and a coal of fire from the altar. And touched them unclean lips. And turned him from a coward. Or from an educated man, a teacher, to a prophet that the word of God could speak to. Amen. Yeah. While he's in the presence of God. There was something different. That thirst that he had had reached that place then till he was filled with it. And let me tell you, friend, I don't care how many churches you join, how many names you put on, which way you go and whether you're sprinkled, baptized, or whatever you are, until you meet that person, Jesus Christ. That, that's the only thing that will really satisfy. Yes. Emotion won't do it. You might jump up and down and shout as long as you want to. Or you might or run up and down the floor and you might speak in tongues as much as you want to. And them things are holy and good. I don't say, I don't say anything against that. But until you meet that person, that satisfying potion, that's something that takes every fiber in your body, not by emotion, but by a satisfaction. I used to see a little sign that said, if you're thirsty, say parfait. Used to be a little drink when I was a boy called Parfait. And I remember coming down the road all, all from fishing. I've been up the pond, old stagnant waters. I was about starved to death. And I seen a sign say, if you're thirsty, just say Parfait. And I started saying Parfait, Parfait. I got thirstier all the time. <laughs> and I, I see, I, I got so I couldn't even spit after a while. I was so, so thirsty. Well, you see, that won't do it. 
There's nothing will satisfy it. I don't care. You can drink Cokes. You can drink anything you want to with them sweetened bicarbonated waters and so forth. There's nothing that will satisfy the thirst like a good, cool, cold stream of water that will quench that thirst. All these other things are substitutes. And why would we want to take a substitute when there's a genuine baptism of the Holy Ghost that satisfies every fiber and longing in the human soul? They like stand right in the face of death like the great apostle Paul said, Oh, death, where is your sting? And grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the experience, brother. That satisfies that holy hush. Uh, uh, that holy thirst that's in you is satisfied. That you don't have to uh, do anything else about it. Yeah, it cleanses the lips. And there is also uh, just uh, people who live upon the emotion. Upon the uh, Some people say, well, we got a lot of that in our Pentecostal movement. And they'll go in, which is fine. They'll pat their hand and play the music. Music stopped. A bucket of water went over everything. Now, we, we do that. We, we got in a habit of doing that. We got, we, we, it, it's become a, one of our customs. Let me tell you something. When you worshiping God in the Spirit and in truth, when it becomes a custom for you to do it, because you think you ought to do it, because you think if you don't shout or jump up and down or dance with the music, your neighbor's going to think you're backslidden, you are drinking from a stagnated stream. Right. Until it fills every fiber. Until the Holy Spirit itself bubbling in you. I don't care whether the music's playing, whether you're playing near my God to thee or whatever it is. The Holy Spirit's still ringing the glory of your heart. That's satisfying. That's God's satisfying potion. Anything less than that, you're done. You might speak with tongue like men and angels. You might give all your goods to feed the poor. You might prophesy and you might have knowledge. You understand all the mysteries and all these things and you still become nothing. Amen. First Corinthians 13. Until that satisfying something that can only quench that thirst. My soul thirsts for the living God. Like the heart painting for the water brook. Unless I can find it, I'll perish when you get to hunger for God like that, something's going to take place. Amen. The Holy Spirit's to lead you uh, to those great fountains of God. Yes, sir. Now, there is a good thing to worship in the Spirit. That's true. But sometimes you have spirit without truth. St. John 4 said we worship God, spirit, and truth. And Jesus is the truth. That's exactly right. And he is the Word. <laughs> the streams God sent to satisfy you in the natural, Satan has polluted every one of them. He's put the poison dope in everyone that he could get into. Amen. That's right. He took that great stream of the church. That, that was God's way. Jesus said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell can't prevail against it. Amen. Now, there's a different arguments of that. The Roman people, the Catholic says, he built it up on Peter. See? And if that be so, Peter backslid a few days. So it, wasn't, it sure wasn't built up on Peter. Peter, the little rock. And then the Protestant says that he built it up on himself, Jesus Christ. Uh, not to be different, but a different with him. He never built it on either one. He built it up on the revelation of who he was. Amen. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonas. Flesh and blood never revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven, has revealed this to you. Amen. Not by knowledge. You didn't learn it by books. You didn't learn it by joining church. You didn't learn it in the shouts. You didn't. But the Holy Ghost itself has yeah. brought the person of Jesus Christ to you. Stand upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell can't prevail against it. That holy thirst has been satisfied in the person of Jesus Christ. There you are. That's the thing that we want to look for. Satisfy that thirst with that. All right. We find that we must uh, knowledge. Oh, my. Knowledge is a great thing. We feel of it today. We're full of it. But you see, knowledge... As I was saying the other day, speaking on that subject of knowledge, there's a man standing outside, was talking to a friend of mine standing there, said, if a man don't believe in education, why is he reading the Bible? See, I thought, well, if they didn't get what their Lord Jesus said, how'd they go to get a dummy like me? What I say? They couldn't even understand him, as plain as he was. He said there one day, except you eat the body, 
the blood, drink the blood and eat the body of, of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. He didn't explain it. Walked on. That's right. See? Well, they said, this man's a cannibal. We want him to eat his body, drink his blood. He's a vampire, see? He wants us to become a vampire. See? Them intellectuals. But he said, my sheep hear my voice. Yeah. It would come to the elected. God had elected by foreknowledge. And those through the Father, no man can come to me except the Father draws him. And all the Father has given me, they will come. They'll understand it. Them disciples couldn't understand it, but they believed it. See? That's right. As you believe it. I can't understand many things. I believe it anyhow. See? Because God said it was so. Knowledge. You know, Satan's gospel is knowledge. Did you know that? He preached it in the Garden of Eden to Eve. And she was deceived by his knowledge uh, gospel. Now, and it's polluted the whole human race with it. It's exactly right. They took educational programs, put them in the church. They're all right out there, but not in God's Word. No, sir. You don't know God by education. You don't know God by, by, by knowing how, uh, learning mathematics and pronouncing big words. Paul, he was a smart man. But when he come to Christ and received the Holy Spirit, went to the Corinthians, he said, I never come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, though he could have done it. He said, I come to you in power and manifestations of the Holy Ghost that your faith would be in God, not in the wisdom of some man. Now, sometimes we make a, the church program. They also call uh, for their, their pastor. The church goes to vote the pastor. They say, well, this pastor now, he's got two degrees in college. He learned four years of psychology. He took this, that, and they'll vote that kind of a man in. Wow! Instead of a pastor who believes in God's Word being inspired and being God, and will preach the Word regardless of how people feel about it. God told Ezekiel, he said, preach that whether they believe it or not. You preach it anyhow. Right. Or they accept it or not. That ain't it. They didn't accept Jesus. He went right on preaching it just the same. Instead of a real well, uh, a pastor that will really preach the Word and believe in God, they, they, they try to bring in the, the intellect. The man who's got the best education, the man who can stand in the pulpit and don't take but just about 15 minutes so they can get home right quick and go some, do something else. And Ricky can get his hot rod and start out and, and they go to twist parties and everything. It's, oh, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's nothing else but a high bred educational pollution. That's right. It's just exactly what it is. That's right. But what is it? It satisfies their taste. See? It satisfies a worldly church member's taste. It don't satisfy a saint's taste. He'll take the word every time. But they say, oh, well, now them people are just a little off at their mind. See, they just don't, uh, they don't get it. They, they're trying to live in a day gone by. Isn't it strange? I come out here in the West, and I find out they're all trying to live in a day gone by. They always want some of the old-fashioned cowboy days. Go down to Kentucky, the old-fashioned hillbilly days. You want to act like it, have programs of it. But when it comes to old-fashioned religion, <laughs> they don't want nothing about it. Old-fashioned days, I come down here to rodeo time. I seen they had a big woman down there, that green stuff under her eyes, and uh, short bobbed hair, a cigarette in her mouth. Well, if they'd have seen that back in the old days, they'd have thought she'd cankered somewhere. They'd, 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 have, they'd have put her in. What if your mother would have walked out dressed like you and your daughter dressed today? What would take in place that had her in the insane institution? Sure, she'd come out without her skirt on. Well, I remember it's the same thing today. Man is rotten in their flesh. If they're going through a, a, the middle age between 20 and 25 years old, their brain cells are rotting too. They haven't got, people's got so they haven't got enough understanding. They don't know what decency means. They don't know the difference between right and wrong. And oh, all oh, their educational program. They, did you know education, I can prove it to you, is of the devil? Amen. Amen. Not to read and write, but I mean putting your education in your church. What does communism lay on? Science, education. That's their God. Satan. See? That's what he introduced to Eve. That's what they're still holding to. Now it's got over in our churches. Got over in the Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian, Pentecostals, and all. Some education, intellectual. Some great so and so, and something like that. That just throws him farther away from God. It's wrong. Yes, sir. Now we find out that they, they satisfies their desire. When, a, when a, a church would vote in something like that, it goes to show what's in that church's mind, what their desire is, what their thirsting is for. They want to say, our pastor's wide-minded. He don't mind us mixed bathing. He goes with us. A little girl told my 
Sarah the other day. Her pastor had been to Africa. And when he come back, she stripped off her clothes that night with a pair of little tights on and done the Watsutsi for him. They entertained him because he'd been to Africa. The Watsutsi is a tribe over there, you know. Boy, I'd like to see one of my girls in my congregation try to do something like that. <laughs> Watsutsi. See, it goes to show, and a pastor would sit and look at one of his congregation, a little 16 or 18 years old girl out there stripped off like that, and let her get by with that, that shows that he come out of a cesspool himself. A man of God do a thing like that. Certainly, that sounds flat, but I realize I'm preaching across the nation too. But you know this also, brother, sister. Let me tell you, that's the truth. A vulture wants dead things. That's right. And that's dead. That's exactly right. Plainly shows. It just plainly shows here what uh, is their head and their control tower, what it's given them. See? What's in their soul? Their soul longeth for things like that. Their soul longeth for a high intellectual church where the people dress real fine and the pastor takes 15 minutes or 20 and if you go over that, they throw it back on the deacon board. And he mustn't say nothing about sin. He mustn't say nothing about wearing shorts. He mustn't say nothing about uh, people doing this, that, or the other. He mustn't mention that at all. If they do, the board will have him thrown out. See what it is? That's the thinking man's filter. <laughs> the Bible said in 1 John 2, 15, If you love this world system or the things of this world, it's because that the love of God's not even in you. Now, what about all this carrying on they've done today in the name of the church? Practicing square dancing in the church. Bunko, bingo, parties, teenagers, rock and roll, twist. All these stuff. Look at this Elvis Presley. A devil standing in shoes. Pat Boone. Ricky Nelson. The biggest indebtedment this nation's ever had. That's right. They say, oh, they're very religious. They sang Christian songs that ought, the, the church ought even to permit a thing like that. Some of these guys go out here and, and tonight they're in a, a roadhouse out here dancing and playing music and everything. And the next night they come to the altar and weep and the next night they're playing music on the platform. Oh, goodness gracious. How far can, how far can filth go anyhow? Yes, sir. Prove himself. First to be a man of God. Not all this stuff just because he beat an old guitar or something. By your desire, you can tell who's on the throne of your heart. But what you love, that's what tells you. You say, well, I think them things are all right, Brother Branham. Well, just remember now, in your heart, you know what's there. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. But what is feeding your soul, what your soul is thirsting for, and you can see it satisfies that if it isn't this Word, then there's something wrong because the Holy Spirit lives on the Word only. I want you to see another great danger just before we close. If you are not, if you're not guilty of any of these things that I've mentioned, and uh, that is the danger of neglecting a thirst. See, you say I have a holy thirst, but uh, I'm not guilty, Brother Branham, of just going join in church and things like this. But uh, see, to neglect a thirst, if you neglect to satisfy a thirst of water or food, you'll die. And if you neglect that thirst in you for God, you'll spiritually die. You call for a revival. You wait for your church to have a revival. Well, you, that, ain't, that ain't the revival for you. The revival ought to begin right in you when you begin to thirst for God. There might not be another member of the church wanting that revival. If it breaks out in you, it'll break out other places. See? But see, you neglect that thirst. You neglect to milk the cow. When the cow is, the udder is full of milk, and if you let that cow stay like that, she'll go dry. That's exactly right. If you neglect to take a drink of water, say, I just ain't going to drink anymore, you'll die. If you neglect to eat food, you'll die. So if you neglect to give the Holy Spirit the Word of God, you'll die. You Christians, you Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, Assemblies of God, oneness, twoness, threeness, whatever you are, see? I don't care. That don't matter nothing to me. I don't think it does to God. Right. See? You're an individual. You're a unit. You'll never go to heaven as a church, a, a, a denomination. Right. You'll go to heaven as one single person between you and God. Yeah, yeah, That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What church you belong to. And if you neglect to read the Bible and to believe the Bible 
and the Holy Spirit to feed up on that, you'll die. Jesus said in St. John 4, 3, the Scripture got right. Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Not just part of it. We take a little bit here. I call that a Bible hitchhiker. They say, well, I believe this, but now let's go over here. See? See? Uh, you've got to take it word by word. Jesus said, man shall live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Do you know that? And you know, we've made, we've made the day that we're living in, we, we made this day the, uh, uh, a religious perversion. And my daughter called me in not long ago and said to me, Daddy, in the next side of the house, she said, come over here, we're going to have a religious program on. It was a singing, hymn singing. There was some little Ricky reading it up there. And if I ever seen a sacrilegious movement, it was that. Them guys up there and people looked more like it was a floor show. Supposed to be an Indian tribe. And they were carrying on and, and jump up and box at one another. Where, what's went with the sincerity? Amen. Where is those old-fashioned hymns we used to sing and rejoice in the Spirit of God and tears roll down our cheeks and now we try to hold our breath and sing until we ain't got enough breath in us till our face turns blue to try to show that we're some sort of a singer. Yeah. We've copied that off of Hollywood. Yeah. Amen. And all these programs that we see through this intellectual hymn singing and training of boys. I, I like to hear good singing. I like to hear good old-fashioned, heartfelt Pentecostal singing. But I sure hate to hear that squeaking they call singing today. That's right. I think that's the most ridiculous thing. It's a perversion. That's right. I like to see a man when he's a man. I hate to see one with, with his wife's underclothes on out here and slipped up along the side and, and a, a roller hanging down here in front and two tones of hair hanging down like bangs cut in front. That, I, I couldn't call that a man. He don't know what side of the race he belongs on. That's right. You see, the woman, look. The woman is trying to cut her, make her hair like the man. The man's trying to make his hair bangs like the woman. The man is wearing his wife's underneath clothes. She's wearing his overhauls. See? Just a perversion right around. And that's the same thing it is with nation, with people, with churches, with everything. Oh, God, where's the end of the thing? The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the end of it. So... If you neglect to feed the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, Jesus said every word should be by the Holy Spirit. And listen, now, if you try to feed it the wrong thing, if it's a genuine Holy Spirit in you, it'll know the difference. Amen. Now, remember, the Word of God is what the Holy Spirit feeds on. That's right. It don't feed on enthusiasm. It don't feed on education. It doesn't feed on church going. It doesn't feed on theologies. There's a lot of difference between an inspired something and a theological standpoint of it. Right. All those theologians in the days of Jesus, my, they had word by word, page by page, all laid out the Messiah had to come this way. It's exactly what it was. And they, everyone missed it. You know what Jesus said when he comes? said, you're of your father the devil, and his works you'll do. It wasn't revealed to them what the real word was. See, they missed those little corners like they're missing today. If you belong to this and belong to this, you'll be all right. If you believe that, you've got to belong to Christ. Amen. And if there's something in you hungering for Christ, just remember, when you were in your father's uh, loins, you were with him then. But your father didn't know you then. And you didn't know your father. And you had to come and be born. God made a way through your mother for the, the seed bed. And then it come, and then you become a man. Or woman, what it was then, you recognize your father, and your father could have fellowship with you. Now remember, if you've got eternal life, your life was in God at the beginning. Yeah. And the light, God is the Word. And then when the Word was made flesh in Jesus Christ, God coming down to dwell in His own body, made Himself the Son of God, when God came down to dwell in that, you were in Him when He was crucified. And you were crucified with Him. And you died with him on Calvary. You was buried with him on the mountain. And you rose with him on Easter morning. And now you're sitting together in heavenly places. In and now you've got fellowship with him. See? God himself become one of us. No man has seen the Father at any time. The only begotten of the Son, uh, Father has declared him. That's God became a man so he could fellowship you as a man. See? 
And now you're, you're flesh and he's flesh. God has made flesh among us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Yes. And in him was God. He was God. Nothing short of God. He was God. God manifested in the Son, Jesus Christ, which made him Emmanuel, as the prophet said he would be. Now, see, then you had to be, before the world was ever formed, your name was put on the Lamb's book of life. And then what can you eat? The Holy Spirit lives by the Word of God. And now in Revelation 22, 19, the Bible said, Whosoever shall take one word out of this, or add one word to it, his part will be taken from the book of life. Amen. See how deep it is? You cannot. The Holy Spirit won't live on the things of the world. Like a dove, bird, and a crow. A crow is a big hypocrite. A crow, that fellow can go out here and eat wheat all day long and go over there and fly on a dead, old dead carcass and eat it too. He can sit in the field and he can eat with the dove, wheat, and go over and eat on a dead carcass. But the dove can eat wheat all day long, but it can't eat on a dead carcass because it's a dove. And a dove don't have any gall. One bite out of that dead carcass that killed the dove. See? It has no gall. And that's the way it is, no bitterness. That's the way with a real genuine Christian. They don't want the things of the world. No. They just eat the Word of God and that alone. What's clean? The thinking man filter. See? They come through that and that alone. The dead things of the world, it, it stinks to them. Look at the old crow in the days of the antediluvian destruction, flying from body to body, eating them old dead carcasses. He didn't come back to the ark, but the dove could find no rest for her feet. See? she come back to the ark where she's getting grain. And that's what we do. We live by the Word of God. In Psalms 42, David must have wrote this psalm, uh, Psalms 42, when he was a fugitive. When he said, My soul thirsts after thee as the heart painteth after the water broke. Look, he cried. David was a fugitive. He had been... He had the anointing all on him. He knew he was going to be king. The prophet had anointed him king. Now notice. And there he was. He had a little bunch of soldiers made up of Gentiles and so forth. Was up on top of the mountain where his own beloved city, because of their sin, they were garrisoned all around with the Philistines. And David on that hot day, it must have been when he wrote this psalm, as the heart painted for the water broke. Notice, David in this condition, he looked down, he looked at his beloved city, and you remember when he was a little boy, he used to take the sheep out by this certain pool there. It was a great great water country and also bread country down there. Really, Bethlehem means the house of God's bread. And then when David remembered going by there and drinking that good cool water, and here he was laying up here now a fugitive, away from his own people. He had no place to go, and his soul must have cried for that good cool water. He had some servants there that, my, just the least of his desire was a command. And they, three of them, fought their way through that line of Philistines, 15 miles, 7 miles or something down back, cut their way through and brought him a drink of that water. But the soul thirst, his body, he's up there probably had to drink out of anything he could get a hold of, some old goat skins and things with some old hot water in on that hot day. He thought, if I could just lay down and quench this thirst that I have, if I could just go down there to Bethlehem and lay down by that spring and drink. And when they went down and got the water and brought it back, his soul thirst was so greater, not for Bethlehem, but from Jerusalem. His soul was so he sacrificed the water, said, I wouldn't even drink it. He poured it out upon the ground. See, his soul was more thirsty for God than it was to satisfy the quench of a good... Uh, his thirst of his body with a good cool water. He poured it up on the ground. See, the house of God, the soul cooling waters of Jerusalem, which is above. Jesus said in John 6, 33, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Bethlehem house of God, our church, earthly church of God, the church that's here on earth. We love to go to the church here on earth. But greater is Jerusalem, which is above, which is God. Jerusalem above, which is God. Greater is that soul thirst to be there with Him than it would to be just to satisfy yourself with joining a church somewhere. See, uh, joining a church don't satisfy that thirst. David proved it. Here, the water is right in the house of God. See, he poured it out upon the ground to find favor to get a good, cool drink from God. Even when it, Greater than the thirst that's in you is that thirst of the soul thirst for God. Notice, Jerusalem, 
The word Jerusalem is from above, the Bible said, which we're, is the mother of us all. And Christ is our mother. We realize that God is our mother, for we're born of him. The word simply means peace. Jerusalem, shalom, or shalom, which means peace. Jerusalem, see, means peace. Greater should be the thirst of any soul for the waters of life than to say you belong to a church. The thirst of the soul can't be satisfied. The real true thirst, it can be perverted. You can think you're all right when you join church, but that isn't it. That won't satisfy the genuine, holy thirst for God. It just simply won't do it. It's just, it's just not there. Now, David said in Psalms 42, 7 here, When the deep calleth unto the deep at the noise of thy water spout, the soul's call. Look, I've often used this as an illustration. If there's a fin on a fish's back, it had to be put there for him to swim with. He has a need for that. Now, what if he say, I'm going to be a different fish. I'm going to be a smart, educated fish. I, I, I just, I'm going to believe some real theology. I believe I can, don't have to have that thing. <laughs> he wouldn't get very far in the water, would he? That's exactly right. What if a tree said, now, I know there had to be an earth first for me growing. That's right. I'm supposed to grow in the earth, but I'm going to be a different tree. I want him to just set me out here in the middle of the street so I can be noticed. <laughs> See? He wouldn't live very long. See? That's right. When the deep calleth to the yeah. deep, yeah. it takes more than joining a church. It takes more than shaking hands with a preacher. It takes more than living a good straight life. It takes something of satisfying. It pours down from God into the soul. The deep calling to the deep at the noise of thy water spouts, O Lord. The deep calling to the deep. What kind of a thirst could we think was in us tonight? We as Pentecostal people, where are we getting to? What kind of a thirst is in us? What kind of a thirst is in me? What kind of thirst is in you? Don't try to hush that holy thirst for God. Years ago, when they used to have gold out here in the mountains, I read a story many years ago. It's always stuck with me. It said there's a, a prospector went out here somewhere beyond the mountains here, was prospecting for gold, and he struck a rich claim. And uh, he come back uh, thinking when he got to the city what he would be, his troubles was all over, and, and he... Uh, he tried to, to say, uh, tomorrow I'll get in and I'll, just one day's journey, he'd be into the city and, and he'd have the gold and he had big sacks full of it. He had a dog with him, not comparing now the dog to the Holy Spirit, but as I'm making an illustration, but this a dog through the night, the prospector laid upon his bed and, and he began to think, now tomorrow I'll, I'll take all my gold in, I'll become just what I've always wanted to be. I, I, I always want to be a rich man. I, I want to own fine things and so forth. And, and then this dog began to bark and because there was an enemy approaching. And he, uh, he went out there and he said, Shut up! And so the dog quietened down and the more he got back in bed, he started like he was going to go to sleep and the dog started again just jumping up the chain and he went to the door again and said, Shut up! I want you to know that tomorrow I'm a rich man, see? And that was his great dreams. But the dog started barking again. And finally he got so discouraged, he went and got his shotgun and shot the dog and killed it. He said, I don't have no more use for you anyhow. Tomorrow I'm a rich man. I'll become a rich man tomorrow. And he set the gun down in the corner, turned his back over to the door, went to sleep. And the man had been following him for days, slipped in and killed him. He wasn't a rich man. See? He stopped that warning buzzer that was trying to tell him his life was at stake. Brother, sister, you'll never be able to, don't never try to hush that holy calling in your heart, see, by joining a church, by reciting a creed, by belonging to a certain organization. There's only one thing can satisfy it. That's the person, Jesus Christ. As a heart paineth for the water of so my soul thirst after the old God. My soul thirsts for the living God. See, there's something in you that wants to see the moving of God. Your soul thirsts for it. Don't stop anything short of that. Don't let some pastor tell you you just have to shake his hand, join the church, or belong to this organization. Don't you kill that holy hush. It's warning you some day will come when you'll come down to the end of the road like a little lady in our city we come from. She told the 
a little girl went up there at church, and a very fine little girl, and she used to come down the street. She had long hair, you know, and her hair, hair pulled back like a slick of the peeled onion nearly, and her face looked no makeup on. And this girl used to make fun of her. said, you didn't have that uh, flat-headed preacher you got up there speaking of me. <laughs> said, uh, said, you could look like something decent, but you look like something out of an antique shop. And, oh, she just really raked her over the coals every time she could see her like that and said, our pastor's broad-minded. said, he... He, he knows uh, them, that, that why you do like that. That don't mean anything, how you dress or thing. It does. God's Bible says it does. We shall live by every word. So this little girl never paid a bit of attention to her. Why don't she's a missionary now? So then this, uh, this young lady took a social disease, and she died. A friend of mine pumped the embalming fluid in her. When she was dying, he told me, he said, after she was dead, he kept smelling the fluid. She had a hole eating her side, social disease. They didn't even, even her parents didn't know what was wrong with her. And she died. But before she died, she taught Sunday school. And all of her little Sunday school group come in. They wanted to see her when she went off to heaven. The angels come and packed her away. And her pastor outside smoking a cigarette, walking up and down the hall in the hospital. And they was all going to sing when she was going to die. You know, they know she had to die. Doctor said she's dying. So they was all going to see the angels come pack her away. And all at once when she faced the reality. Now, she was a loyal church member. She was a Sunday school teacher and a loyal church member of a fine, big denominational church. But when she started to struggle, death struck her, her eyes bulged out, and she said, I'm lost. She said, I'm lost. Go get the pastor. He put his cigarette out and walked in. said, here, 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 here. We'll get the doctor. He'll give you a hypo. He said, I don't want no hypo. He said, you deceiver of man. I'm dying and I'm going to hell and I'm lost because you failed to tell me the truth. Go get that little good used girl and bring her up here to me real quick. She's right. Wait till you face the reality once. Don't you try to stop that holy hush. Don't you blast it away with some modern educational double barrel shotgun. You listen to that warning of the Holy Ghost tonight. That's warning you, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, and he is the Word. Let us bow our heads just a moment. I want to quote one more word of the Lord Jesus while you're thinking about it. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst. It's even blessed to have that thirst in you. Have you come to a spot that your 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 whole system has been so polluted by denominationalisms and little cults and clans and things, little church orders, social like joining lodges and so forth from church to church? Has the devil been able to put that water of pollution and you're slopping out of it like a hog in a trough when you don't even know what the real quenching thirst of God to see him a reality by the Holy Spirit living in you manifesting? If you're if you're that way tonight, if you're still thirsting for God, let me tell you, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins where sinners plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. That dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. There may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Ever since by faith I saw that stream thy flowing wounds supplied, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. If you've got that thirst tonight to know more about God and to come closer to Him, will you just raise up your hand now while every head's bowed say, Pray for me. Oh, God, look at the hands. Out into the land where the broadcast is coming now from east, north, west, and south, you and them rooms, raise up your hands to the pastors and whatever is there that you desire. You're something in you thirsting for God. That holy thirst, don't satisfy it. Oh, you say, Brother Branham, I, I shouted once. I danced in the Spirit. Don't, 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 don't take that. No. Wait till that satisfaction comes. The satisfaction potion of the fullness of the Holy Spirit comes in. Then these joy bells of shouting and speaking in tongues and dancing in the Spirit will come. You won't have to do it by the music. You'll do it when you're going down the road in your car. You'll do it when you're sweeping the floor. You'll do it when you're driving nails in the wall with your carpenter work. Wherever you are, that joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, long, lengthy, drawed out this little message tonight. But dear God, 
May your Holy Spirit deliver the, the meaning to every heart. Right in this church tonight, there was just multiplied numbers of hands up all the way around the halls and everywhere. We, we pray, dear God, for them. Oh, may that satisfying potion of God, which is Christ, the hope of glory, the hope of life in you, may it come to each one of them way out across the nation from California, way up in New York now where it's early in the morning. They're listening in up there over in, in uh, New Hampshire and, and down along in Boston, all the way down in Texas through Indiana, out into California and around. Oh, God, look at those hands. Look what's beneath them, Lord, that heart there is hungering and thirsting. This perverted day where the devil's blinded people's eyes just to join church and say, that's all you need. And they still look at their own self and see the way they do and the desire they have to be like the world. And when the Bible tells us if we even love the things of the world, the love of God's not even in us. Just think, Father, how perverted that he can make that real true word. How that they can say, oh, we believe the Bible, but not this. We don't believe this. We believe this is for another age. We believe this is that. Because some denomination has twisted their minds into that cesspool. When Jesus said, whosoever shall take one word out of this or add one word to it, his part will be taken from the book of life. Dear God, think of the disappointments there, judgment, when people's lived a good, clean, holy life. Went to church just as loyal as they could be and lost. Think of those Pharisees, how from little boys they trained in the Word, come up through schools and everything. Holy had to be or they'd be stoned to death. And Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil. How did Israel went down there and let this be a warning to the Pentecostals, Lord, across the land. How did Moses, the prophet, came down into Egypt to fulfill the Word of God to bring the evening light to them. How they seen the great miracles of God. How they followed Him, crossed the Red Sea, was baptized into Him, went into the wilderness and eat angels' food that fell from heaven, and then refused to take all the Word. When they come back from Kadesh Barnea to Kadesh Barnea from the, from the Promised Land and said, they're like giants. We can't do it. When God said, I've already given you the land. Borderline. Jesus said, there are every one perished. They're dead, lost, without God. Though they've done all these things, they've seen these miracles, enjoyed, danced up and down the sea coast with Miriam when they beat the tambourine, and only three out of the two million went in. We realize, Father that when the sperm, the genes from the male and female come together, there's only one out of the million that's accepted. One germ from the male finds the fertile egg of the woman, the female, and a million others perish. There's a million, two million come out of Egypt. Two, Joshua and Caleb, entered the land. One out of a million. Father, I, I tremble when I think of that. Think across the world today, 500 million Christians, that'd be 500 if you should come tonight. Oh, God, let us remember that every word of God stands a memorial. We must believe it. We must obey it. And when you said, repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children, and to them it's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And God, you're still calling tonight. And the promise is as long as you call. And clergyman has twisted the minds of those people and directed by an educational, denominational school of theology to a thing to say, oh, you just believe. The devil believes also. But he can't receive the Holy Spirit. Judas is a carrot with the, done all the, the rest of the disciples did preach the gospel, but when he come time for him to get the Holy Ghost, he showed his colors. God made the people of the land tonight realize that without that experience, they're lost. May it be tonight that their souls will be satisfied with thy potion, Lord, as we command them into thy hand. 
They're yours, Lord. We're only responsible for the Word. I pray that they'll believe with all their heart and be filled with the Holy Ghost. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. I love satisfying potion. Oh, you love him with all your heart? Now, them words are sometimes cutting. Let's just sing in the Spirit now. See, Each one of us now. Let's shake hands with the uh, brother sitting next to you, sister, and you say, God bless you, pilgrim, as we sing it again. Amen. Shuck hands with you. There. Now let's just close our eyes and sing in the Spirit. Raise our hands to Him. taking piano, my little boy's taking trumpet, but I, I did learn an instrument, a ten string. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> Jesus is with me, counselor, it's of me, my God is me. Love him. Well, 
Walk in the light, a beautiful light. Come where the dewdrops of mercy are bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. We'll walk in the light. It's such a beautiful light. It comes where the dewdrops of mercy are bright. Shine all. Worship God with everything you have. When the saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in, I wonder if you got your feet converted, you don't dance anymore out there for the world. See? Let's pat our feet to the Lord. To the Lord. You, is your hands converted? You don't steal anymore? Your lips are converted? You don't lie anymore? Just don't get religion in your head. Get it all over you. Amen. It's a full man. That's right. Now, let's pat our feet. When the It's a beautiful light. It comes where the dewdrops of mercy are. We'll shine all around the fire. You believe he's the light of the world? Yeah. Do you? Paul said, when I sing, I'll sing in the Spirit. Yes, if I worship, I worship in the Spirit. See? Whatever you do, do it all in the Spirit. That's right. And the Spirit brings the Word to life. Is that right? That's right. Yes, sir. All ye saints of light proclaim Jesus, the light of the world. Grace and mercy in His name, Jesus. 
Then what do we do? We walk in the light, beautiful light, and where the dew drops on the earth, shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, by Sorry to confuse you players like that, but I just get carried away. I don't know no better than just to worship. That's the way we do it. I'm thankful for this opportunity, Brother Mac, to come and fellowship with you and your church here tonight, all these fine people. And you that raised your hands for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I trust that you'll meet Pastor Mac here or some of them and go back in a room here. And just remember, when God spoke the word in the beginning and said, let there be, there had to be. And he said, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Amen. See, it's got to happen. Amen. Come to visit your pastor here and stand by him as he preaches the gospel. Now, let's sing again that good old song. I just love that. We'll walk in the light. Jesus said, I am the light, and you're in him. See? Amen. How do you get into him? Joining him? No. Shaking? Now? Baptism of water? No. By one spirit. Amen. We're all baptized into one body, which is the body of Christ. Amen. And in that body is nine spiritual gifts yeah, right. operating through the local body, the local church. That's apostolic if I ever knew it. That's right. So we will keep in the light. It's a beauty.